Herzlich willkommen zurück. Ich hoffe, ihr hattet alle eine schöne Mittagspause mit lecker Nudeln und guten Gesprächen und freue mich sehr, euch jetzt wieder hier zu sehen. Wir machen weiter mit dem ersten Block am Nachmittag. Wir wollen uns ein bisschen Zukunftstechnologien bzw. aktuellen Technologien und ihren Chancen und Risiken widmen. Und wir freuen uns sehr, dass als erstes in diesem Blog Jutta Steiner sprechen wird. Sie ist die Gründerin von Parity Technologies und Parity Technologies beschäftigt sich damit, wie man Unternehmen, aber auch anderen Organisationen Blockchain-Anwendungen erklären kann und näher bringen kann, in der Hoffnung, mehr Vertrauen wieder in digitale Technologien und im Internet zu sehen. Herzlich willkommen, Jutta. Danke. Ähm, ich habe die Slides, die ich jetzt mitgebracht habe, sind auf Englisch. Also ich kann auf Englisch oder Deutsch vortragen. Wird es jetzt ein bisschen davon abhängig machen, wer englischsprachig ist. So, who like, who only speaks English in the audience and was like prepared to only... Okay, then if it's fine for the other ones, I would do it in English. Yeah? Okay, cool. Uh, might be a bit less awkward also, in, like, I don't have to translate everything and whatnot. Um, cool, yeah, I'm, I'm really glad to speak like, in, at this event about the stuff that we're doing. Um, I mean, I don't know, how, how many of you think they understand blockchain somewhat? Have heard about pa uh, Bitcoin? Ethereum? Okay, who owns tokens? Cool. Um, yeah, I don't want to give any token investment advice. Who has heard of ICOs, knows what an ICO is? Okay, yeah, there's a bit of crazy things happening at the moment in the space, but I don't want to talk too much about this. Um, instead, I want to actually try to um, explain what this technology fundamentally has to do with um, the web or how to improve the way how the web works, fix things that um, are currently very prevalent and that we are worrying about um, at the moment. Um, so yeah, I mean, um, I got into the space about two and a half, three years ago. Um, worked for the Ethereum Foundation that m some of you might, might know. Um, that was like basically the biggest invention after Bitcoin, the Ethereum project. Um, that's tried to kind of abstract the um, Bitcoin technology and make it more um, accessible or useful in other um, in other context. Um, and so I worked for them, but then we started a company called um, Parity about um, almost two years ago now. It's a UK registered company, um, but most of our team is based here in Berlin. And um, it might be um, interesting also for many of you who are based here in Berlin or in Germany that um, actually a lot of this stuff, um, and especially the in more innovative projects in the blockchain space are um, Berlin based. And I think it's um, most of them um, have founders from abroad that come here because there was sort of a smaller nucleus um, and, and that attracted a lot of talent and so there's a lot of things going on here like a lot of really interesting meetups that are happening where people talk about what this technology could, um, could bring on um, as a change. So yeah, and parity, I mean, actually goes also beyond um, blockchain. Um, it's, a, it's a company that tries to develop systems, um, protocols to fix things that are currently not working very well with the web, trying to, um, trying to build infrastructure for a decentral web where um, data is in the hand of users and everybody has a bit more control um, about what's going on. So, um, I mean, I, yeah, as I said, like, I want to try to give a bit of a more, more, a more sort of philosophical talk in some ways. Like, I don't want to try to explain in too much detail what a blockchain is or whatnot. Rather, yeah, as I said, like, give you a sense of why blockchain is interesting and, and what's happening in this space. So please feel free to interrupt me if I speak about something that's, that you don't know. Um, I'd like to have this as a conversation as much as possible. Um, otherwise, I'll, I'll um, keep some time at the end for questions. So um, what do I mean? When I say the web, let's let's start maybe um, at that at that point of the story. So the web for me is mainly a transformative platform, or could be a transformative platform. I guess we've all seen that it's changed a lot, like the way how we talk, communicate to it with each other, the way how we do business with each other. But to a certain extent, I think it's um, far under its potential right now. Um, there are many many problems as well, but. Um, It has transformed our lives. It has transformed High Street. Like, there used to be lots of record stores. Now, these days, um, there are more cafes. 
um, than record stores. Um, but it has much more fundamental impacts on our society, or, or might have, actually, if blockchain becomes what people think it, it could become. So what is the web beyond that? So the web is mainly access, access to information. So we all know social media, Wikipedia, like the information um, and freedom that it has brought us. Um, but this came also with a lot of problems. Um, so how do we deal with access rights, privacy policies, statutory rights, like all these things um, that people became more, users became more and more aware of uh, most recently. I don't know, who of you has ever read like user TNCs on websites, like what companies do with your data actually? Has anybody ever read like a full TNC? Okay, one person, two people. Okay, so yeah, many problems. Um, but then, and this is a bit more of a recent development, I guess, it's also like these days access to the economy. Like we do a lot of things on the web, like banking, shopping and whatnot. But to that end, um, the web is actually under its potential. I mean, the web in that regard basically has only provided us a way for th making things more efficient, but mainly as a proxy for how, we've, how we used to do things in any case. Like, we used to have institutions that facilitated trade between people, and basically what we still have on the web now these days are like, as well, institutions. There's Amazon, like, there's banks. We always have to go through these third parties in order to, to do business with each other. And, um, in that way, it's just an extension of how things used to work. Like, still everything is siloed, there are lots of barriers um, and, and self-preserving authorities that remain. So, and this is what I mean when I say Web3. Web3 basically going beyond um, these two things. So, I mean, many of you might be familiar with the term Web2 as coined by, or like used by, um, Tim O'Reilly, like I'm not so much referring to these definitions of Web3 in the sense of semantic web, Tim Berners-Lee, to me it's just the next stage of what the web could be um, as a transformative platform for society. So another way of looking at this, like the traditional web, when you, I mean, who would trust anybody that they met like 10 minutes ago on the internet? Anybody who would trust these people? Um, Probably not. And it's because the web fundamentally at this, at this state requires us to, I mean, or it doesn't allow us to develop trust independently to people or when we want to interact on the web um, uh, to develop. So the web requires us to fundamentally work very manually and rely on other people, other institutions. That, that's sort of what the, what the world today is like. Um, while in the future, if blockchain and other technologies become more and more adapted, we have like tools in order that allow us to, um, to, to do things much more independently and without relying too much on, um, on other players um, when we do things on the web. So Web3 basically consists of um, a stack of technologies, some of you that you might be familiar with. I mean, it's still like an, just a normal user interface. Um, there's some layer that will allow static publication of data. There's some layer that allows dynamic, dynamic, dynam dynamic messaging between users, um, encrypted ideally. Um, but then there's a fundamentally new technology which helps to manage expectations on the web. And expectation management has a lot to do with um, what is trust or the way how we trust on the web. Um, so what do I mean by expectation management? Um, expectation management in some ways is like, um, or the way how you could look at it, it's a, it's a native protocol layer um, that's some sort of digitization of, of civil law. Like, um, it's, it's a protocol that allows us to come to agreements to do transactions independently of third parties, but with a native protocol that executes and keeps track of these transactions. And this is basically what Bitcoin does, right? I mean, Bitcoin is a native protocol that allows you to, in this case, only send monetary transactions, like a, a wire money, without relying on a um, payment provider, on a, um, um, on a clearinghouse for um, executing the transactions. And, Ethereum is a um, further development of this technology that allows you to, to execute basically all sorts of agreements. And um, some of you might have heard the term smart contract. So smart contracts are in this way a native way um, on the internet 
for doing, um, doing transactions. Like you could think of in this way using um, blockchain, for example, to build a fully decentralized Uber or whatnot, where like the full um, transaction that's currently happening on the um, centralized Uber, um, uh, Uber um, servers is executed natively on a protocol level on the web. So this is another way of looking at this. I mean, I would argue like this is exactly what blockchain brings, and this is sort of an artist's impression of, of what a blockchain is. Like it's a, it's a shared system, like a global digital commons, where rules are baked into this um, protocol, like the rules that's what Cartman is standing for, um, that are automatically executed. Like in contrast to, to the current stage, where we basically give authority to institutions, modern institutions like PayPal or Facebook, that keep track of how things work, and in the end decide in case of um, contention. In this case, this is necessary because it's baked into the technology. Like the technology comes with the automatic execution of, of a rule set of basically civil law agreements um, that people enter, that people in, um, um, that people um, get into um, when they interact on the web. So this is the new model of society, and this is why, why we basically believe that blockchain has a very, will have a very transformative effect on society, because it fundamentally re removes these institutions that we've so far relied on um, in the past, both in the digital and in the pre-digital world. Another way of looking at this, and, and which basically became... So, I mean, when we started to build Ethereum, like, okay, we knew we were doing some improvement to Bitcoin, but didn't really understand what we were building ourselves. And what became clear over time to us is that one way of interpreting Ethereum is that it's a sort of global computer, like a shared computer, but in a, in a very different, that's working in a very different way from a normal computer. Like, while for a normal computer, um, I mean, first of all, it's non-local, it's sort of an emergent effect from many, many um, nodes working together and sort of creating a global virtual machine that people can use. That's the first difference. But then secondly, it's completely transparent. Like, um, everybody who shares the system can, um, can check and verify all the transactions that are happening, which is very different to when we're currently interacting with other services on the web where we always have to rely on what's happening on the servers. Um, and then the third thing is it's fundamentally secure um, because every interaction with this machine is um, authenticated by strong cryptography. Like you don't, whenever, like, and, I mean, the fact that, for example, Bitcoin or Ethereum hasn't been hacked on that level. I mean, there have been hacks and I'm not saying like the technology is like, um, completely perfect at this stage, but the security model is very different, and because every, every transaction, every interaction with this mach machine has to be um, completely um, authenticated with a um, cryptographic, cryptographic signature, that, that introduces a very different security model, and is, for example, also one of the cases why people think this is so important in the future when every device will be on the web and um, on the internet connected, and so you need strong crypto in order to actually have, um, um, uh, have secure IoT applications. Okay, so this is a bit of background like where where things are at the moment, or wh why we think um, blockchain is, is so important. Um, there's a lot of things. I, another thing I wanted to, to give you a bit of flavor um, is um, where, where blockchain is at the moment. I think there's a lot of confusion. Um, in, when you look at the press, I mean, a lot of people complaining about like, oh, there's mining, there's proof of work, that takes so much energy and, and whatnot. Like, I mean, yeah, sure, this is the case right now, but I mean, if you look at other technologies, like take X-ray at the beginning, like it was really, really dangerous to actually do X-ray, right? And then we developed and improved the technology and it's kind of the same thing for blockchain. So, I mean, the technology is slow at the moment, there's proof of work, um, but there's a lot of, progress and a lot of projects going on that try to improve um, uh, what, what blockchain can do and how performant it is. And one of the projects that um, we are working on actually um, tries to come up with a model for doing um, 
uh, interoperability between this cha these chains, which is currently not possible. Um, so often blockchain, people talk about it, that, is, is that, that it's like, oh, you get the impression when you get into the space that, um, that blockchain is basically a solution for everything. Um, but it's far from that at, at this stage. I mean, many of these chains are not interoperable. Well, actually, none of these chains, chain, chains are interoperable, so Bitcoin can talk to Ethereum. And there's a lot of problems with, with this maximalism. Um, so maybe... Yeah, maybe I'll give you um, a bit of background now on, on what's, what's the sort of things that are going on beyond... ICOs um, and, and this craziness that, that you might have heard about. So what we are trying to achieve at the moment is we're starting a new project called, um, called Polkadot um, that will be a crucial piece of infrastructure um, to basically deliver on all the promises that people currently associate with blockchain, like this full interoperability um, between different chains, like smoothless transactions um, and whatnot. So Um, let me see. How much time? How much time do I have? Oh, three minutes. Oh, sorry. Oh, maybe. Okay. Then maybe let's let's skip that. Let, let me maybe then rather take a few questions because I think maybe this is this is in the end going a bit in too much depth. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I think that's maybe better. Sorry. Thanks. Sorry. We thought we were gonna. Filled up those last three minutes. In mm -hmm. that case, do you want to have one question if somebody yeah, from maybe. the audience wants to ask one? You can raise your hand and we'll come to you with a mic. I'll ask a question that I've been asked and I can mm. answer probably. Um, I recently saw uh, somebody else give a talk about the blockchain and showed a graphic about distributed computing and it reminded me terribly of a graphic that I was shown in the 90s about the wonders of how the internet would work. And he was explaining how it's all very different this time and decentralized and just the way you explained. And then somebody asked the question, how do you ensure that if we're talking about uh, Bitcoin specifically, and Bitcoin technology, that people are sort of at the control points, the miners don't become a similar bottleneck or a similar control point as in mm. other decentralized structures mm. I think okay that that's actually um, a good question and sort of goes into the same direction as I just mentioned like with with mining so there's a lot of confusion happening about um, with regards to like what the state of the technology is right now um, and and what is needed to make it actually um, so so that it can provide what, what people expect from the technology. And mining is one thing. So there are lots of um, projects that try to come up with other mechanisms for coming to consensus um, so that miners actually won't be that powerful. And it's one of the technologies that we are also working on. There are things called proof of stake, um, which will probably help to overcome these issues. So um, I think in, in that regard, like um, it's important when you get into the space to be aware that many discussions are very ideologically driven and, and very much driven by the stage of the technology at this point in time. Thank you. Thanks very much for coming here today Thanks. and talking to us. <laughs> a big round of applause. Bye. <laughs>